about your relationships. Think about how you relate to people. Think about the friendships and relationships that really go deep for you, let's say with family or with a loved one who's maybe a partner or a spouse or children. Think of those relationships that are very meaningful to you and think about how you are in those relationships. Maybe you're different with different people and how those people are with you. Dan Allender in his book, The Wounded Heart, talks extensively about styles of relating as they pertain to those who've been sexually abused. Now, since the first edition of his book, this concept of styles of relating has been greatly expanded by many others as a way to describe a pattern of behavior that develops really as a defense strategy when a person has been significantly hurt in some way. And with any model, these are general concepts. They're intended to help you and me see something about ourselves that would be harder to recognize without the model. But remember, general concepts are never going to fit perfectly to an individual person. So we want to keep that in mind as we go deep into what this model looks like. So first, let's get some background. To understand the styles of relating that this model describes, it's helpful to be familiar with the concepts of shame and contempt. Now, Dan Allender defines shame as that awful experience of becoming aware that we're being seen as deficient and undesirable by someone that we hope would deeply enjoy us. And while legitimate shame can shine a light on something we've done wrong, what Allender would call our depravity, illegitimate shame happens when someone assaults some part of what Allender would call our dignity that part of us that remembers having been made in the image of God. Contempt, on the other hand, is an attack against what we perceive causes the shame. And contempt can go either way. We can go throw shade on ourselves by hating and belittling ourselves. Or we can throw shade on others by hating and blaming them. The worst case scenario is when we hate and blame ourselves and also hate and blame others. Whichever direction that contempt goes, it ends up covering shame and deadening our God-giving longing for relationship, for being deeply known and loved, and for deeply knowing and loving others. So that brings us to the style of relating. Those are strategies people use to try to stay in control of the relationship and to cover over that nakedness, which now feels shamed, and to take care of ourselves, to stop being vulnerable. It's really kind of a Genesis 3 response. Before anyone shamed us, spiritually and emotionally, we were like that first man and that first woman in Genesis 2. And they are both of them naked, the man and his woman, and they're not ashamed of themselves. But after that first time of being shamed, here's what happens. The eyes of them both are opened, and they know that they are naked, and they sew fig leaves and make to themselves girdles. And then they hear the sound of Jehovah God walking up and down in the garden at the breeze of the day. And the man and his woman hide themselves from the face of Jehovah God in the midst of the trees of the garden. That's what we do. We cover our vulnerability over and we hide from the people we have relationships with, beginning with God. We don't want to be seen. Instead of trusting God to get us through that awful experience, to strengthen us as a result, to make us wiser and deeper and stronger and braver, we close up and we close off, even from God. Dan Allender describes three styles of relating in his book, The Wounded Heart. He starts out with the good person, and then he moves to the tough person, and then he finishes with the party person. And some have sort of expanded this, and they see a couple of more categories. So in that good person group, they also see another category, the little girl or the little boy. And then in a similar fashion, some see the tough person type kind of either as a busy bee or a distant and driven person or a controlling person. So if we were going to create a chart of what all these relational styles might look like, maybe it would look something like this, with an idea of how each type might relate to the other types and what strategy they likely would use to make life work and how their style impacts other people. Now, I remember looking at this chart years ago, and I also read Dan Allender's book, and the impact of the chart and the book was actually in itself a shaming experience. I did recognize myself, and I didn't like having who I was categorized as a relational style that I had to repent of. 
It took wise friends and counselors to help me see the creativity and courage it took to find a way to cope with the life I had when I didn't know any other way. But now, because I now could see these things, it was clear God was inviting me to something much better. So let's go back to those Genesis stories and see how God helped that first man and woman. Look at what God did for them. Here they are, quivering in fear, clutching their self-sewn leaf garments, and they're hiding from the one relationship that could save them, not to mention hiding from each other. First, God asked them to tell their story, and God listened to them. And then God explained what life would be like now. They were going to experience the world in painful and disappointing ways, and their relationships would all be fraught. But then God made a sacrifice, through which God would provide much better garments for them. And that is part of what the Lord offers you and me today, better ways of relating in a world that we often experience as painful and disappointing. And that better way comes through sacrifice, a sacrifice God makes on our behalf. And when we put our faith in God through Jesus, we receive Christ as our new clothing, as the Apostle Paul wrote. Now, this I affirm and insist on in the Lord. You must no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding. They're alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance and hardness of heart. They have lost all sensitivity and have abandoned themselves to licentiousness, greedy to practice of every kind of impurity. That is not the way you learned in Christ. For surely you have heard about him and were taught in him as truth is in Jesus to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. So what is our part in taking off our old self and clothing ourselves with this new self according to the likeness of God? Well, it begins with honesty. You and I need to seek the truth about how we've been harmed and how we now harm others, often even without realizing it. We also need to understand how shame and contempt have taken their toll in our lives. And then we need to move to repentance, defined by Dan Allender as an internal shift in our perceived source of life. This is not simply changing behaviors, but rather it involves changing core motives, a person seeks to rely more on God to supply the energy and courage and motivation to step out of old strategies and coping mechanisms and step into spiritual and emotional maturity. So, for example, a little girl or a little boy might take a risk to be competent where they used to be helpless. A good girl or a good boy might learn to say no if they always are trying to please others by saying yes. A busy bee or a distant or driven person might linger at a social gathering when their deep desire would be to be more productive. A controlling man or a controlling woman would pursue feedback rather than intimidate those around them into not expressing their anger or their problem or complaint, whatever it is. A party girl or a party boy could admit their tendency to bail out on those who no longer meet their whims of the moment. They could try more faithfulness in friendships. Part of my own process was to find love for each of these styles of relating, to see the beauty of God's creation within them, and consciously choose grace instead of contempt in the way I thought about them. Then I wrote a story in honor of the friend who introduced me to this way of thinking. And here's the story. Everybody ready? Cindy asked. Fuzzy Bunny curled one of her long ears around her soft little paw and looked up at Cindy through her lashes. I'm ready, Cindy, she said in a soft high lisp. Daintily, she lifted her paw up to Cindy's hand for help in getting into the car. Busy Beaver tisked and tisked, sharpening her pencil with her front teeth. I have Bunny here, she said, as she ticked off the names on her guest list. And Lambkin is also checked off. Kitty is here too and me, of course. But where is Puppy? 
I specially sent her a note with all the directions and the correct time. I called her this morning to remind her when to arrive. I made sure she had a map and careful instructions on how to get here. Fleecy Lambkin patted Beaver's paw, her eyes wrinkling in concern. There, there, Beaver, don't fret, she said. You know how Puppy is always late. She forgets the time. You know she means well. This is just like Puppy to be so selfish and think only of herself, Silky Kitty said as she glanced at her watch. She could be on time like the rest of us. Fuzzy Bunny's eyes widened at Kitty's irritation and pressed close to Cindy, trembling just a little. Beaver gave a brusque nod of agreement while Lambkin went from person to person murmuring, there, there, and she'll be along soon, and it will be all right. Down the road, playful puppy was bouncing and barking as she chased a butterfly off into the flowers. She jumped high and grinned with pleasure as she watched the sunlight dance across her burnished fur. How she enjoyed the warm sun and rich smells, sniffing the flowers, looking under leaves, playing with the butterfly and barking at the birds flitting in the trees. Back and forth, back and forth, she scampered off the path and into the grass. As she came bounding up to Cindy and her friends, she laughed, what a beautiful day. I'm so excited about our picnic. Let's go, let's go. She looked around at all her friends with a happy smile, then jumped into the car. Kitty hissed. You are late, she said with a low, angry growl. You could at least say you're sorry. Puppy opened her eyes wide and looked up at Cindy. But I didn't mean to be late, Puppy whined, wagging her tail slightly as she turned back to Kitty. I just got distracted. Cindy shooed Kitty into the car and settled into the front seat. Ready, Beaver? Let's get started, Cindy said as she patted their picnic basket at her feet. Busy Beaver bustled into the car, tisking and tisking at Puppy's tardiness. There was still so much to do. Beaver keyed their coordinates into her GPS, checked the gas to make sure they had a full tank, opened up the windows and drove carefully onto the road. Finally, their picnic adventure was underway. Now remember, Beaver said, we are supposed to get to our destination by noon. We're starting a little late. And here Beaver glanced meaningfully into the rearview window, trying to catch Puppy's eye. So I hope we get there on time. Does everybody remember their tasks? Lambkin nodded her fleecy head, eyes wide with earnest obedience. I do, Beaver. I will do everything you need. Lambkin turned to playful Puppy and continued, I know Puppy will be very helpful too. With this, she smiled sweetly, soliciting Cindy's approval. Won't she, Cindy? Silky Kitty stared eloquently out the window with a puissant arch to her back. As Fuzzy Bunny said, I don't remember, Beaver. What do I do? Busy Beaver had written an itinerary for everyone. They were to arrive at their special picnic tree with its shady branches wide, promptly at noon. Bunny was in charge of spreading the tablecloth. Kitty was to fill their cups with iced tea. Lambkin had graciously volunteered to make all the sandwiches and serve each person. Beaver planned to have them dine at 1 p.m. Cindy had made some delicious cookies, an exceptional treat for today's adventure. By 2 p.m., Beaver had written on their itinerary, they would have their dessert. Beaver didn't bother to give Puppy a job. She knew Puppy would just tell stories, run and play, and interfere with everyone's work looking for attention. That's okay whispered Lambkin to Puppy, concerned about her feelings. Kitty sneezed scornfully. Look at the flowering trees, aren't they pretty? Cindy said as they drove along the country road. Smell the breeze filled with fruity perfume. Bunny curled herself into Cindy's lap and smiled. Kitty gave herself a tongue bath, bored, as playful Puppy prattled incessantly about all her recent adventures. Lambkin listened politely with a quiet, interested expression. She had her tidy little hooves folded neatly on her lap, just so, leaving extra room for the others. Soon they were there and found a spot beneath their favorite apple tree. Abundant blossoms wafted gently, white and fragrant. 
and sunlight dappled the ground through leafy boughs. Busy Beaver briskly lifted the picnic basket from the car and walked purposefully over to their picnic spot. She brought out her menu diagram with instructions for Fleecy Lambkin. She brought out her iced tea recipe for Silky Kitty and a diagram for cup placement. She brought out the picnic blanket and handed it to Fuzzy Bunny, outlining how to lay the blanket down in a perfect square. I'm too widow to spread this blanket, said Bunny in her most plaintive voice. She held one end in her downy paw with both of her ears hanging limply by her sides. Incompetent, bristled Beaver under her breath. She bustled over to Bunny and with exaggerated patience walked her through the diagram of how to spread the blanket. But I can't do it, wailed Bunny, looking with large pleading eyes at Cindy. Bunny kept bunching the blanket up in her fuzzy little paws, crying louder and louder with big sobs. Nobody will help me, she said, stomping her little bunny foot. Silky Kitty hissed and spat. Just do what Beaver showed you, she said angrily. What will I put the cups on if you can't spread the blanket? But I'm just widow and helpless, said Fuzzy Bunny in her tiniest voice. You are annoying and manipulative, said Kitty, her whiskers twitching with aggravation and her ears pinned flat against her head. It's true, snarled Puppy. You're just making a scene when we could be having fun. Oh, stop, do stop, cried Lambkin, her fleece curled tight in consternation. They don't mean it at all, Bunny, said Lambkin as she cast a doubtful look Kitty's way. I will help you, she said and Lambkin patted Fuzzy Bunny with a tender little pat. Then Lambkin gently took the blanket and spread it across the grass. She took the cups of iced tea from Kitty and placed one down for each plate, then made sandwiches for everyone and served them with a nice smile. Where was playful puppy now? Beaver had shooed her off after she'd poked her nose in all of Beaver's diagrams. Puppy hadn't liked being ignored with all this fuss and bother over Bunny so she had flounced off, bouncing and prancing along in the grass and flowers, chasing bees and sniffing under logs until she had wandered far from the group. Beaver tisked and tisked, then called out to Puppy, Come back, Puppy! It's time for our picnic, and we are waiting for you! Puppy lifted her head, distracted at every step by the breeze and the fluttering branches and the singing birds and the skittering beetles, happy to be the center of attention once again. Finally, she came trotting back and sat at her place on the blanket. Puppy babbled endlessly between mouthfuls about all she'd seen and done as she played in the grass. Again and again, Kitty yawned dramatically, showing all her teeth and her long, uninterested tongue. The tip of Silky Kitty's tail flicked with jejun disdain. Whenever anyone looked at her, she would roll her eyes in an elaborate way. But when no one was looking, she licked the crumbs off of Fuzzy Bunny's ears and batted flies away from Puppy's plate. Busy Beaver picked up the empty dishes, brushed together the remaining morsels, made sure everyone had enough tea, and bundled the rest of their picnic things back into the basket. Oh, look! With a cheerful flourish, Beaver brought out Cindy's special cookies at just the proper time for dessert. Fuzzy Bunny leaned contentedly against Cindy and laughed at all of Playful Puppy's silly stories. Fleecy Lambkin sat quietly and watched with a kind smile. She neatly tucked herself together at her spot on the blanket next to the, to the softly purring Silky Kitty. Beaver chuckled with quiet satisfaction as she tidied up the cups and cookies. Cindy looked lovingly at each of her friends. She would help them to see each other with the same tender care she had for them. She would help them to see the good inside each of them, and she would help them to enjoy these picnics more and more. Let's take a picture, Cindy said. Smile! And they all did, wrapping their arms around each other and forming a happy circle around Cindy. Well, I hope you enjoyed my story. As I'm sure you could tell, it was an allegory, including all those relational styles, but there is good in each of us, for the Lord Jesus has put it there. 